we should get started. Thank you all for coming today and welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Johanna and we're here talking about building community wealth with green stormwater infrastructure stories from the field. Um, I'm a researcher at the Democracy Collaborative and an author on our new report that just came out about this exact subject. If you haven't read the report yet, you can find it at community-wealth.org slash green infrastructure. And um, this webinar is being co-hosted by our friends and allies that are at the Summit Foundation who made this entire report possible and the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange. So thank you very, very much to both of them. To start us off, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists um, and then provide some kind of top line uh, perspectives from the report and then really transition into our all-star list of panelists who are here today, many of whom represent the case studies profiled in the report, doing climate resilience and community wealth building on the ground, uh, ending with some opportunity for, um, for Q&A from our audience. And with that, uh, let's get us started. So um, Babak Tandre is a worker owner and founder at the Demo or, um, at Dig Cooperatives, and he, which is a worker co-op in Oakland, California. Established in 2005, Dig Co-op is an innovative green general contracting firm specializing in integrated water conservation, management, recycling solutions for people and the environment. This include things from gray water systems for irrigation and indoor reuse um, to flood mitigation and emergency or um, earthquake and fire preparedness. We also have Carlina Arango, who is Verde's Landscape Program Coordinator. Uh, Verde Landscape is in Portland, Oregon, and it hires and trains crew members from Coley and other low-income areas to offer higher value, higher skilled landscape services. She acts as the training liaison for the landscape crew members training program developing effective training, recruitment, and hiring pathways for the crew. Then we have Elisa Mansweiser, who is the Executive Director of Land Force in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Land Force helps to restore and maintain land and green assets by providing professionally skilled crews who historically have faced a variety of barriers to entering the workforce. Elisa is also an anthropologist with over 20 years of experience working in community-based development and natural resource conservation. Um, also in Pittsburgh is Matt Barron, who is a program officer for sustainability, um, the strategic area by the Heinz Endow Endowment. The Heinz Endowment is a foundation with a range of different issues, including sustainability, and Matt's work addresses community and economic development, um, as well as environmental, just, um, environmental justice issues. And then last but definitely not least, we have Paula Connolly, who is from the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange, which is um, one of our co-hosts today, but also a network committed to making green stormwater infrastructure work in cities. Um, she has led major policy initiatives for Philly's renowned Green City Clean Wonders program, helping to change business as usual to implement over 30 acres of green stormwater infrastructure on vacant lands, parks, streets, and private property. So thank you all to um, our panelists for coming on today. Uh, I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about. And uh, with that, we'll jump right into content. And so I put this quote um, here kind of to center our conversation. Um, ben Hirsch is an organizer who's from Houston. Um, and after Hurricane Harvey, he was kind of describing to me visceral terms the impacts of climate change um, and in a conversation we were having early on in the research that I was doing for the report that is related to this webinar. Um, and he said, there are so many layers of unfairness. The lack of investment by the city over time rendered Northeast Houston more vulnerable to these flooding events. You live near an oil refinery, so your health is degraded, so you don't work as much, so your house is poorly maintained, making damages even worse when you have a flooding event. Then FEMA says you're ineligible for money because they're not going to take care of pre-existing damage. That is the stack of complete inequity of climate and infrastructure together. Climate impacts like this one articulate for me a collision of kind of systemic problems like ra racism, inequality and disinvestment and you know, really articulates that like most vulnerable to climate change are often those who have been politically or economically disenfranchised. Um, and you know, really in the next hour and a half, 
what we're hoping to do is provide kind of one intervention of the whole constellation of strategies um, that we need to kind of uh, take on justice in the face of intensifying climate effects. It makes it clear to me that when we're talking about climate resilience, it can't just be walls. It has to be bigger than that. Uh, and so we need to really alter the status quo of economic and social injustice. Um, but what is the alternative? Um, and how, how do we actually restructure so that we get what we're looking for? Um, and so at the Democracy Collaborative, we uh, put forward a framework of community wealth building, which is an inclusive and um, sustainable development model that really seeks to build from the ground up a vibrant place-based economic system where we're really focused on democratic ownership and control to create flourishing life. Um, and so I put this particular image up on the screen for us um, because I think it illustrates how we want to transform and redistribute power within communities. Um, in the first pie slice, we see the business holding the majority of the power without community in the picture. And the second slice shows a redistribution that holds community at the center. Um, and particularly, capacity building for climate resilience will mean kind of reconstructing an active community that can actually deal with the complexity and the, um, the uncertainty and in the inevitability of climate change. So, um, you know, let's bring this all back to green infrastructure. Um, and I guess the first thing that we should really handle is what, what is it? Um, oops, and I jumped too quickly here. Um, so when there is excess water from things like snow melts or heavy rain events or storm surges, um, not in natural systems, what usually happens is that um, it, the soil usually soaks it up with the help of plants. Um, however, right now, the situation that we have is that our cities are covered with impermeable surfaces, such as concrete. And, you know, water then falls on things like parking lots, and there's no soil to absorb that water. And, um, you know, it starts to flow wherever the top topography is going to take it and collects all these pollutants along the way. And um, in some highly urbanized areas, we're seeing around 90% of rainwater hitting the ground Run, and running directly into our sewer systems, overwhelming the system's capacity, and potentially putting raw sewage right into our waterways. And with climate change, we're seeing way more extreme water events. Um, you know, too much water, too little water, just like at the exact wrong time that we need it. And, um, you know, I think we can see this uh, very well in the hurricanes that have hit recently, as well as the extreme flooding that's happening, um, that happened very recently in the Midwest. And green infrastructure really describes the practice of harnessing natural processes to manage that stormwater that's associated with those things. You know, it means often like ripping up concrete and replacing it, you know, in a very, this is a non-nuanced way of saying it, but like replacing that with plants. So it can include installations that are rain gardens, which pretty much are depressed planted areas to absorb water, rainwater harvesting that captures water for later use. Um, you see this like green roofs and, and, and things like that. And um, I'm sure our panelists today are going to describe in even more depth um, some of those examples. And but you know the question here again is why would we focus on green infrastructure as a strategy for climate resilience and community wealth building? I can tell you. So while green infrastructure is primary function is to limit stormwater runoff, it be its benefits provide us um, opportunities to build kind of safer, um, healthier local communities. Uh, for instance, greened areas can create more public spaces that can foster community. We've got plants uh, that are helping uh, by kind of implementing plants, we can alleviate the urban heat island effect and clean the air quite literally, you know, limiting asthma, which is, uh, you know, even more prevalent in lower income communities. Um, and you know what we're starting to see is that cities are investing more in climate resilience strategies over the next few years. And um, it, in part, they are, they're actually required in some places because of these things that are called consent decrees where they haven't been actually been able to deal with the amount of stormwater that's coming through. And um, so 
as they are actually ta taking more investment and really investing in climate re resiliency, they have to do it with, um, from our perspective, an eye for equity, um, so that we aren't just creating, you know, ecological enclaves, um, but we're actually distributing the benefit of this green infrastructure and its kind of multiplicative benefits. One of the benefits specifically is designing green infrastructure implementation to support what we call community wealth building or uh, enterprises that um, actually can increase the resilience of community members, uh, particularly those vulnerable to climate change by actually providing jobs because economic resiliency is often an indicator, uh, or excuse me, economic vulnerability is often a uh, indicator of climate vulnerability. And um, so that's what we're gonna really focus in on today is community wealth building enterprises. And to, to articulate a little bit better what that means, we see community wealth building enterprises um, as not driven solely by profit, um, but often instead also provide um, certain community services or workforce development or um, purely just a respectful employment, um, as well as often being uh, related to uh, sustainability goals. And uh, in this particular report um, around green infrastructure and um, for climate resiliency and community wealth building, we talk about social enterprises and worker co-ops. And um, when talking about social enterprises, we're really talking about uh, businesses that are run by a nonprofit whose main goal is to provide really a social good. Uh, they offer fee for services. Um, and then that also can um, help them generate revenue to support other programs or are also um, have a grant, uh, grant end as well. And then we also have worker co-ops uh, who are businesses in which members um, invest and own the enterprise together. They share in the profit. Um, the decision making is generally democratic and governed by this concept of um, one member, one vote. And we're gonna hear a lot from some really, really amazing practitioners that are social enterprises and worker co-ops today. Um, so I'm showing this slide as well because I wanted to highlight um, kind of the role that anchor institutions can play here um, in strategies for green infrastructure and community wealth building. Anchor institutions are often large nonprofit public uh, economies, um, public economic engines, excuse me, in cities uh, that are like local government or universities or even healthcare institutions or hospitals, as we can see in those cute little icons right there. Um, and these institutions have often what we call sticky capital because unlike some businesses, they can't really leave. Um, they are more place specific. And when it comes to green infrastructure, these institutions both have a lot of stake in building a thriving local economy, but they also often operate kind of larger campuses that um, have often stormwater concerns that they have to consider. And so they actually have to invest in some of this stuff. So in the report, we dig into um, kind of strategies to build community wealth. Um, with, through community wealth building enterprises. And this, the range of strategies really went from the systemic to kind of the very brass tacks of, you know, how do we start these things up? Or, you know, how do we actually implement the contracts? And um, in each piece, so you know, um, we have both uh, recommendations for practitioners but also for anchor institutions and local government of, you know, how do you actually um, increase the ability for community wealth building enterprises to take up a bigger share of the role in green infrastructure implementation. Um, and so um, I'm not gonna dive too, too deep here because um, I'm actually pretty sure our panelists will provide some helpful examples. Um, and we encourage you to read the report for even more information um, and, they, they are, uh, each of the people who are on the call here, um, or the different social enterprises and worker co-ops, you'll find their case studies in the, um, in the report itself. Um, but just to give you a taste of the types of recommendations that came out of uh, over, you know, over 30 interviews and uh, with both experts and practitioners um, and community organizations, but also, you know, lot, quite a bit of desk research. Um, we had four pieces that we, we really address in the report itself. Um, first is really about 
grappling with how we design employment models to create that economic resilience that I've been talking about, um, thinking through everything from workforce development models as well as relationships to unions who have historically been in the water space. Um, we also map the intersection between green infrastructure and the potential for displacement. Um, many communities across the United States are actually really grappling with gentrification. Um, and so we tried to develop some relationship between green infrastructure implementation, as well as affordable or community controlled housing strategies. Um, we also tried to understand um, the barriers that community wealth building enterprises are running into to even just get off the ground. Um, and then uh, as well as some of the strategies that, strategies that have worked quite well um, so that uh, we can actually see how we can build some of these new community wealth building enterprises. And then uh, the last piece is a deep dive into different contracting models for community wealth building enterprises. Um, you know, looking at everything from large scale contracts with municipalities to, you know, maybe the more um, residential projects. And, um, you know, this is again providing opportunity perspectives for the practitioners themselves who are trying to gain access to more of this work but also on the other side as well from a policy driven perspective or a contracting driven perspective of anchor institutions or local government how do we actually widen that opportunity for community wealth building enterprises so i don't want to take up any more of this precious time so you can hear from our amazing practitioners and folks who are um, who are really on the ground here um, but a reminder that you can find the actual report itself at community-wealth.org slash green infrastructure. Um, and what you'll see here on the screen right now, um, you can find, um, we would be more than happy to send you physical copies of the report as well. And um, we'll drop it into the chat, but you can fill out the form, um, this bit.ly link here, or there's even a QR code if anyone's holding their cell phone and wants to just snap it now. Um, and we, if you fill that out, then we'd be happy to send them to you as well. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this off to Carlina. So Carlina uh, would love to hear from you uh, and Verde Landscape. Great, thank you, Joanna. Um, hi everyone, my name is Carlina Arango and I am the Landscape Program Coordinator at Verde. Um, so my work focuses on developing and implementing a training program structure for our crew members, as well as providing general project management support across the, very, the various areas of our, of our program. All right, our story. So Verde Landscape is the longest running flagship social enterprise of the community-based nonprofit organization called Verde. And we are based in Northeast Portland's Cully neighborhood. And Verde's overall mission is to serve communities by building environmental wealth through social enterprise outreach and advocacy. And social enterprise is at the core of Verde's strategy. It's through social enterprise development that Verde is able to create jobs and raise revenue directly while also engaging in the day-to-day -day work of neighborhood improvement and um, green infrastructure services. And Verde's lands uh, Verde Landscape's mission as a social enterprise is to build sustainable landscapes and empower communities. Our work. So we offer a suite of urban forestry and green infrastructure services. This includes urban restoration, stormwater management, urban tree planting, and sustainable landscaping for a wide range of partners and clients. So we work for affordable or with affordable housing providers, general contractors, government agencies, environmental groups, and other um, property owners. And this is a really cool um, picture here on this slide that shows um, two of our crew members out in the field, um, I believe working with one of our soil and water conservation districts um, to do some um, native tree planting and they get to do some canoeing to do that. Um, and our people. So our enterprise recruits crew members from within the Cully neighborhood. Um, we do this primarily via outreach activities and word of mouth. Um, our crew members are recruited from affordable housing development located within the neighborhood, 
um, with a focus on the housing that is owned and operated by Hacienda Community Development Corporation or CDC. Um, so Hacienda is a developer and provider of affordable housing and social services and we work pretty closely with them. Um, and this is a picture of our crew um, at Coley Park um, having some lunch. <laughs> Our model. So Verde Landscape Social Enterprise model works through pairing living wage employment with, uh, with workforce development, training, um, and complementary education and skill building. So when Verde Landscape creates a full-time job, we begin a two to four year investment in the new crew member by providing livable wages, benefits, training, and asset building opportunities. And each crew, regular crew member earns a starting wage that reflects the living wage for a single person in Multnomah County. And crew members also are offered annual raises. Um, Verde Landscape pays 100% of a regular crew members' health insurance premiums and offers up to $225 per month towards dependent premiums. Uh, Verde Landscape is able to provide regular crew members with individual learning plans and through this learning plan, uh, a regular crew member receives on average uh, 80 hours um, per year of classroom training. And the goal of, of this program is for each crew member to graduate via one of our three avenues of graduation. So number one is moving on to another ecologically minded organization, um, which we call destination employers. Number two would be creating your own landscaping business. And number three is transitioning into a permanent leadership position with Verde. Um, which is primarily within our landscape program. Oh, and here's a photo of um, one of our graduates, Carlos Lopez, with our past program manager and founder of uh, Verde. <laughs> okay, and so our relationship with the larger community is mainly through the Living Cully Coalition, which is a community-based collaboration among Habitat for Humanity, Hacienda CDC, Native American Youth and Family Center and Verde. And the mission of the Living Cully Coalition is using sustainability as an anti-poverty strategy. And one of the biggest projects that Verde Landscape's been a part of is um, Cully Park, which is, a, which is a project where we converted a former landfill into a new 25 acre park for Portland's most diverse and park deprived neighborhood. And our crew members provided landscaping services for the park's native gathering garden, as well as the park's habitat restoration on the north slope of the park, among other features. And another really cool um, project that we did within the larger community is 72nd Street, where we worked with Verde Built, which is one of our other social enterprises that focuses on construction and weatherization. And through this project, we developed a green street to create access to Cully Park. And it was a great opportunity to pilot non-standard street designs for reducing impervious area um, on street development. And like I mentioned before, we have a really close relationship with Hacienda CDC as a place where we recruit crew members and also as a place where we can connect our crew members with trainings on financial literacy and asset building activities. All while, and this is all while getting paid by Red Landscape to participate in these opportunities. In terms of government, um, nearly all of Verde Landscape stormwater management involvement is in partnership with the city of Portland. And so this goes back from um, the, city, the stormwater facility installation and maintenance at sites like Hacienda, Nea, Glencoe, and Adaka Park, and to our current commercial scale citywide projects and contracts. And so we're able to kind of really grow our relationship with the city thanks to our highly technically skilled crew members. Um, and lastly, um, we've had this past fall, we were able to pass the Portland Clean Energy Fund, which um, is, a, is $30 million in new annual revenue for clean energy and clean energy jobs in Portland. And this presents um, opportunity for um, new funding revenue and um, a new re a relationship with the city that wasn't there before. So the hope is to start working more closely with our city council on how to make uh, models such as Verde Landscapes. Uh, more viable. Uh, and I think that's, that's all for today. Thank you. 
Amazing. Thank you so much uh, for that. And um, just so you all know, uh, we are going to be hosting some of the Q&A. So seeing some things pop up already, that's really great. Um, hoping to hear from you all very soon. Um, and we'll do that at the end of all of our panelists speaking. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, Tondre, um, who is from Dig Cooperatives. Take it away and I'll make sure it can. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Great. Good morning from Oakland, California. We're about 10 hours south of Carla's hometown, uh, 600 miles or so. <clears throat> and uh, my name is Bob Tandre. I go by my last name, it's simpler. Uh, I've been in DIG Cooperative for about, well, since 2005, uh, one of the original co-founders. So we've, we've had many um, shapes and forms and identities with uh, different uh, members through the year contributing their different gifts and talents. Uh, at this phase, if you go to uh, second slide, you'll see our current um, list of owners. We're merging with a landscape contractor, so we're going to take on more landscape work similar to uh, Verde doing uh, an urban uh, restoration, um, whether it's erosion control, flood mitigation, um, pretty specific to the Bay Area, a lot of issues with stormwater, especially uh, uh, Alameda County has a stormwater ordinance that uh, anyone trying to uh, install more than 2,000 or 2,500 square feet of impervious surface uh, house slash hardscaping uh, has to do something for their stormwater. Um, they don't want, uh, in a lot of uh, areas, they don't want to see an increased, uh, because a lot of developments happening in the Bay Area and small cottages, uh, three bedroom cottages are turning into, oh, five to six bedroom uh, larger mansions, two story. So uh, curbing the uh, stormwater flooding issues around uh, the Bay Area is really important. Um, especially there's one project that we took on. Uh, if you go to this next slide, this is an overview of, you know, how we like to uh, capture, captivate people with simple um, schematics that teach, uh, you know, how to develop small projects, uh, residential, or school grounds or playgrounds um, and public parks so that they're part of a solution and not the problem. Uh, simple sayings like slow it, spread it, sink it have uh, a greater impact in my experience, uh, cap capturing more people with simple uh, technologies and simple um, descriptions uh, as opposed to having to use the complex term terminology that uh, is more important when you're working with uh, city officials or counties or uh, inspectors. So we, we play both ends of the spectrum, um, trying to educate the community. A lot of our pilot projects beginning uh, with the eco house, you can see on our website, there's a little description about this uh, constructed wetland gray water system that we designed and installed with the help of the community. It was built as a, similar to a barn raising. So the workshops were uh, slideshows in the morning and hands-on uh, installations in the afternoon uh, over the course of several weekends. And it gave people more of that um, service learning training that uh, is so important to give people a sense of, you know, the value of a hard day's work. And uh, that is something that I think uh, we try and address in our company as well as, as creating a, a, a good living wage, which is really difficult right now um, that the Bay Area is very tech heavy. Uh, it's really hard to compete for housing um, to give our workers laborers, um, the kind of wage they would need to buy a house in the Bay Area. So most of the people who work for us now, excluding me, because I'm originally from Oakland, um, 
commute to the Bay for work. And this has become really uh, an issue uh, with kind of the service communities being outlying within a 25 mile radius for those uh, communities that serve the wealthier communities that are closer here in San Francisco and now Oakland and Berkeley. <clears throat> so going to our next slide, you see kind of a mix of the incoming call. Um, we've got uh, the impact of the 90, 1991 fire, uh, a lot of development occurred post fire that wasn't, didn't have much as, as far as stormwater uh, planning involved. So a lot of issues to the right, you can see erosion, um, gullies forming and uh, some, some uh, houses are sliding down the hill. Uh, and they are in need of uh, incredible amount of forestry, uh, reforesting these hills um, in order to uh, dampen this, this issue. Also down in the flats, we have a lot of issues on the left with flooding. So the hills are eroding, the, the flats are flooding uh, more and more as uh, Johanna said that uh, more extreme events. So next slide. This is how we addressed one of the projects, uh, one of the issues that people began um, complaining to the city. And it's an odd scenario of people complaining, you let me build my giant five bedroom house where my existing three bedroom cottage was in the hills. So they have a much bigger house, less, uh, absolutely no stormwater infrastructure in the hills. Uh, downspouts just drop on the within a few inches of the foundation and you have uh, a lot of problems. Um, here's the interesting issue we felt we dealt had to deal with uh, as far as equity. So the problem is spe specific to the hills, but it was an unfair program to uh, provide people who live in the hills who generally have more income with a free service that the people in the flats, as you notice down where the white areas are uh, by the uh, bay and estuary, uh, it wasn't gonna be a equitable program. So we had to convince the city to allow everyone uh, the same uh, issue, um, free rain barrels and also installation assistance. So that's what we offered them. It was a year long project. Of course, a year long project really means it took three years, a uh, year before and a year after. So um, that was one of our successful, uh, if you can see all those dots represent rain barrels that are now existing. We call them storm surge tanks. So they, they can catch a rain and then slowly meter out the water over a period of a few days as opposed to one uh, huge uh, deluge. So next slide. Um, we've done project, public projects with schools, uh, with uh, city spaces, city uh, property. On the right, Chabot Space and Science Center in the hills trying to deal with uh, their parking structure. And that has been, yeah, this is their effort to reduce uh, overflow. Um, next slide. Also constructed wetlands. We've, um, that's the project to the left, the Berkeley Eco House. It was one of our um, shining jewels of a project. It's just really stunning, beautiful thing to visit. Um, it's a tiny version of what you see to the right. To the right, that is a picture of Arcata up north here in California. A whole city has, uh, town has converted their raw sewage into a, a beautiful bird sanctuary uh, estuary. So next slide. Uh, this is um, our couple of training programs we did uh, with the city of Berkeley, uh, I mean, sorry, city of Oakland uh, Green Works uh, job training program, uh, summer job training. Uh, we worked at a church in East Oakland 
helping to make a uh, public thoroughfare safer um, and more community centric. So they, uh, kids are more uh, apt to protect this area. They, they put their own uh, labor into it. So there's some ownership. Um, and this is something that DIG was a, a lot more in, involved in early during our uh, first five, six years. We did a lot of trainings and trying to educate the public more on these, these options and these, these strategies. So uh, since then, let's see, next slide. Well, here's another project we did as well. East Oakland Boxing Association, uh, after school program for kids in a kind of a risky neighborhood, uh, 98th Street Avenue in uh, Oakland. Uh, and this is a safe space um, where it's a, a garden and a model of water conservation uh, strategies that we train the, the youth on. Um, we really wish we could do these every year because uh, it really was, it was life or death for some of these kids. In fact, one of them was uh, murdered the day before the graduation. So we all really felt the impact of our, uh, our, our touch on this site and how much they, it mattered to them to have like a positive, safe, secure sanctuary space in an otherwise really violent area. Uh, next slide. Oh, that's it. So I'm happy to wrap that up and you know take any questions. Um, thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, uh, Tandre, for really uh, diving into what it looks like in Oakland and kind of the impact that you all have been able to have um, in in the Oakland area. Um, and again, continue, folks, if you are interested to pop questions into the Q and A, and at the end, I will hopefully take some. Of um, and I'm going to move us on um, to Lisa from Landforce, and, and um, directly after will be Matt, um, a ca her counterpart as well um, in some of the projects that they're putting on in Pittsburgh. So Elisa, I will let you take the floor. Thanks so much, Johanna. And um, thanks to you and the Democracy Collaborative, the Summit Foundation GI Leadership Exchange for this opportunity to tell you a bit about Landforce and also to learn about these other wonderful organizations. It's great to know that um, the efforts that we're having in Landforce are being uh, replicated in other places as well. So Landforce is a Pittsburgh nonprofit that combines workforce readiness and land stewardship. We hire people with barriers to employment and work on environmental projects throughout our region, like green infrastructure, trail construction, vacant lot improvements, habitat restoration, tree planting, tree care, invasive plant removal, and garden bed installation. Simultaneously, we support our crew members' transition to family sustaining jobs with an intensive training and case management support. We are based on a model that we developed in a local, while we were working in a local community development corporation in 2011, building a 280 acre park on um, steep hillside that's that wrapped around that neighborhood. But we've been independent since 2015. We just hired our largest cohort to date with 25 trainees and are entering our fourth season. We are supported by the contracts we work on by individual donations and foundation support, including from one of our biggest supporters, the wonderful Heinz Endowments, who you, you'll be hearing from shortly. For the first time in 2019, we're also receiving state and federal support. Next slide, please. So this is a list of the soft skills training we provide. Clearly, I don't have enough time to speak about all of them, but I wanted to give you an indication of the breadth of the trainings that we provide and if you like, give you the opportunity to take a screenshot. There are some important themes that run through our training though, and these include reinforcing trainings with real on-the-job experience at our land stewardship sites under the supervision of our site supervisors, both of whom were former crew members. We also um, aim to create a respectful employment environment. And finally, um, we emphasize trauma-informed care and restorative practices. This last is, became particularly important when we realized last year that the number of crew members with mental health diagnoses and substance abuse disorders had increased from about 20 or 30% in our first year 
to more than 60% and close to 70% last year. Next slide, please. We also provide a wealth of environmental and hard skills trainings, including a variety of certifications. The knowledge is important so our crew members can work well and safely on the jobs that we do. And the certifications are important, but not necessarily because of the certifications themselves, but rather because it shows future employers that a crew member can successfully learn new work-related skills. Next slide, please. Our crew members meet weekly with our work readiness manager. And as you can see from this photo, they meet no matter where they are working. Together, they identify their employment goals, any barriers to these goals, and then create an individual employment plan to meet these goals. Each crew member is responsible for implementing their own plan, and they continue to check in weekly with the work readiness manager. Because working on their employment goals is written into their job description, and because they can receive paid time off to complete tasks towards these goals, if a crew member consistently does not follow through, they can receive similar disciplinary warnings as if they were regular work infractions. Next slide, please. The next few slides show our crew members at work on a variety of projects. It's important to realize that we pay our crew members $15 an hour and are able to do so because these are all paid contracts. Next slide. We need our clients to believe in our model and our crew members' futures so that they will continue to hire us for contracts and we thus we need to maintain their trust. We do this by providing excellent service. Next slide, please. This last sh slide shows just a couple of the GI projects that we've worked on, um, and we are increasingly working on more and more green infrastructure projects. But it gives a sense of the range of the kinds of work we do. On the left, we designed and planted this trailside green infrastructure project ourselves. On the right, um, we, correctly, we, we corrected some poorly engineered structures. Um, in, in the case uh, on the right, we moved 17 tons of aggregate by hand, by human power into this retention basin. And that was certainly a job that proved our crew members metal. Next slide, please. Note that the photo on the right was taken um, in Hazelwood Green, and that's the location that Matt will be telling you about in a moment. Uh, but talking about our results for a minute, you can see that we have um, spent over, the, since 2016, since our first season, we spent over 21,000 hours of land stewardship time. Um, we've worked on 81 individual project sites, provided nearly 4,000 hours of workforce readiness training, and 800 hours of case management. We've served 47 individuals and people transition in and they transition out. So they'll spend a total of about six months with us before they move on to other employment. Um, and this is all, this is all, um, this is all working for us because 72% of our crew members completed their tenure with us. 97% applied for jobs before they left us and 82% were offered jobs or went into industry trainings uh, by the end of the time that they were with us. In 2018, the average hourly weight, their average hourly, hourly weight after land force was $16 an hour. Just wanted to say a word about why tracking our metrics is important. I mean, it's important both so that we can show um, to potential and existing donors um, that we, what we are doing um, and how we're, we are living up to what we claim we're doing, but it's also because it helps us understand where we can do better. And it's the reason that we understood that we had to focus more on the mental health and restorative practices of our crew members than we had so far been doing. We have a lot to be proud of, but we also know we have some way to grow before we can truly meet everyone's needs. Um, we are where we are today because of the support of lots of different people, and that includes um, our financial um, donors, but it also includes a whole host of other organizations across the United States who hosted us and welcomed us as we we're examining and exploring how to um, expand our program here um, and make a real impact in the neighborhood. Um, so in the, in the spirit of paying it forward, since, since we were the beneficiaries, we are always happy to talk to other communities or other organizations who are considering starting programs like this. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We're always happy to chat and share our own experience too.
Great. Thank you so much, um, Elisa, for kind of showing us what it looks like to be at Landforce and um, how you really have thought of like the whole worker in um, the work that you're doing. And now I'm going to uh, hand it over to Matt from the Heinz Endowments to kind of talk a, a little bit about the work that uh, how it re your work relates to that of Landforce. Thanks, Johanna, and thanks to all of the organizers of the webinar today and the Democracy Collaborative for putting out such a great report. Um, my name is Matt Barron. I'm a program officer here at the Heinz Endowments in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, the Heinz Endowments is a regional foundation that provides about $70 million in grant funding every year in the 10 county area around Pittsburgh. Um, and I wanna start, next slide please. I want to start by uh, just providing a little bit of context for how we landed on green infrastructure as a strategy, uh, as a foundation. It's something we've been supporting for a uh, little over a decade now. And as Johanna mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, Allegheny County, which is the county where Pittsburgh is located, is under one of these federal consent decrees. And that's designed to reduce sanitary sewer overflows and combined sewer overflows into our waterways. Uh, three major rivers run through the city of Pittsburgh and the surrounding area. And while those are incredible freshwater resources, they're also heavily impaired by industrial point source pollution, but as additionally by stormwater runoff um, into the rivers. So we, we began looking at that consent decree as a real opportunity because that includes three to four billion dollars of investment over the next couple of decades. And a grassroots strategy really emerged about eight years ago to say, you know, if we're going to be spending this three to four billion dollars, let's spend it in ways that has secondary and tertiary and, and direct community benefits rather than go the traditional route of building giant concrete tunnels and, and using only gray infrastructure to solve the problem. Let's look at green infrastructure as an opportunity that has a lot of co-benefits in addition to addressing those stormwater challenges. And one of the other aspects of that that really began to emerge is the threat um, both in the future and today of climate change and the changing precipitation patterns we're seeing in this region. We had five feet of rain last year, which broke all existing records. And we, all, we know given the, the data that that's gonna continue. And one of the benefits of green infrastructure is that it's extensible and it's flexible. You know, once you have a big concrete tunnel in the ground, you can't change that easily. But with green infrastructure, you can evolve and change as conditions change. Uh, next slide, please. So we looked at green infrastructure as really an intersectional strategy here at the Heinz Endowments that would um, hit on a number of our goals simultaneously. So it obviously has the goal of protecting the environment of public health by reducing those stormwater um, CSOs and SSOs, but it also through programs like Landforce and other programs we support can help close the wage gap, can help uh, prioritize clean and green jobs, can help support equitable development in our communities and real community resources instead of, again, kind of the traditional gray approach, which addresses the problem but doesn't provide any of those additional benefits. So we, we landed on this strategy as one that would accomplish you know, four or five of our goals all at one time. Um, next slide, please. And one of the ways that we have the privilege of being able to do this is, as Elisa mentioned in that last photo, um, the Heinz Endowment, along with two other local foundations, owns a major development site in the city of Pittsburgh, which we call Hazelwood Green. It's 178 acres right along one of our three riverfronts. Um, it's a former JNL steel mill uh, that the foundation community purchased once the mill closed in the late 90s and um, went through a long environmental remediation process to kind of restore the site to a buildable site. Um, there's one building remaining on the site today, and we're in the process, as you can see in this plan here, of developing a huge mixed-use, mixed-income community that we hope will be integrated with the existing community of Hazelwood right across the railroad tracks. So we have this huge site, and we one of the, the commitments that we've made to the, the broader regional community is we want to do a few things with this. We want to include at least 30% of open public green space. 
We want it to be a net zero energy site. We want all of the water to be captured and filtered on the site. So we saw green infrastructure as an obvious way to achieve that water retention and filtering goal. And with the additional uh, priority of first source hiring and contracting, we wanted to pull as many residents from the surrounding area as possible to be able to participate in programs to achieve those goals. So Landforce became an obvious candidate to apply for contracts on the site to help us start to build out that green infrastructure, um, as well as some of the landscaping on site. Uh, the other kind of aspect of this goes beyond the foundation is that Pittsburgh, um, and as Johanna mentioned, there's a real institutional opportunity to get engaged in this. Over 40% of the property in Pittsburgh is non-taxable because we have so many hospital systems, university systems, and government units here. So we really wanted to serve as a leader and show those other institutional landowners that there are things that they can do with their resources um, when they're already doing these contracts for landscaping to invest them in businesses that are having a social return in addition to um, just the benefit of getting the work done. Next slide, please. And a secondary aspect of this is that we at the Heinz Endowments last year uh, launched a new initiative called the Restoration Project. This is a 10 year uh, or $10 million multi-year strategy to look at the criminal justice system locally, to analyze what's going on in the system and to disrupt those aspects of the system that we don't feel are actually serving the goals of justice. Um, we've been in our first year of grant making around this, but one of the things that we've really learned quickly um, and programs like Landforce and Elisa's staff and crew members have really helped us with this is that there are all of these barriers, uh, hard and soft, once people have been um, incarcerated, once they're getting out, that we didn't really recognize fully before we started really diving in and talking to our partners about it. This includes things like fines, fees, and restitution that people that are leaving the prison system and jail system are required to pay. It includes things like driver's license suspensions and how difficult it can be to restore a driver's license once you're out and how difficult it can then be to get a job as many jobs require driver's licenses. And then the, the aspects of trauma and mental and behavioral health that Elisa spoke a little bit about. Often those are things that land people in incarceration and incarceration can exacerbate those problems. So, you know, wouldn't necessarily make a direct connection between green infrastructure and looking at ways to disrupt the criminal justice system, but one of the incredible things about land forces it has helped us make those connections and now we're able to be much smarter about how we're investing our money and kind of disrupting and, and improving these systems and that's it for me thank you amazing thank you so much matt and really appreciate uh coming in with a anchor institution kind of lens here and seeing how we can rate relate things like community wealth building enterprises to um, the, these landowners that are in, um, in these uh, different cities. And now last, I wanted to hand it over to Paula from the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange, um, who has been um, so wonderful in um, getting you all to the table here for the webinar. Um, without further ado, Paula. Thank you, Johanna, appreciate it. Uh, you can skip right to the next slide and we'll kick it off. Thank you so much. So again, yes, Paula Connolly. I'm the director of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange. We call it the exchange for short. Uh, we are a peer learning network of about 60 communities in the US and Canada, um, mostly representing uh, local government folks and water utility folks. And our focus is on creating a playbook for communities to implement green stormwater infrastructure. Um, and so it's not just the nuts and bolts of creating a green infrastructure program, although that, that's a lot of it. Uh, it's also very much about how communities can really meet the full potential of transformational change through green infrastructure. So within that framework today, I'd just like to talk about some of the ways that members within our community um, are really approaching intentionally uh, the idea of community wealth building. So in other words, really from the perspective of one of those four institutional anchors, our anchor institutions, what is the role of local government in community wealth building? Um, so next slide, please. 
Um, so one of the ways that governments are approaching and supporting community wealth building is through policy um, and market signaling through policy. Uh, the city of Grand Rapids uh, is exploring uh, right now alternative stormwater management policies that essentially give developers who are normally required to manage the stormwater that comes from the development on the property, they're giving them an, an alternative uh, to manage some of that requirement off property. Um, and it's a very dynamic proposal and there's a lot of elements to it, but what I think is most interesting of, like, of this trading program as well as others that have come before it as it relates to community wealth building is that by encouraging stormwater management and ideally green infrastructure to occur in other places, you're encouraging the distribution of the benefits of gas green infrastructure in neighborhoods where otherwise development is not occurring. So by this seemingly small change, this nuanced approach to policy, you're opening the door to alternative uh, avenues of benefits building and community wealth building. You're also opening the door to the types of alternative business enterprises that we've heard about today, um, folks like Landforce and Verde and Dig. Uh, and so by this nuanced change, you're really creating a, a landfill of alternatives uh, that can bring to bear a lot of benefits for neighborhoods that otherwise wouldn't see it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another way that communities are approaching this idea of community wealth building uh, and local governments are approaching this concept is actually through how they're directly implementing projects. Um, I really like to highlight the city of New Haven when I talk about this idea because they're really taking some creative and interesting approaches to scaling up the green infrastructure in their city while keeping it affordable, which to me is sort of a tenet of community wealth building as being a responsible stewards of community resources. So the city of New Haven is focused um, ex almost exclusively on implementing these roadside rain gardens wherever they can. They've implemented, as of last I checked, at least 50 of them. And they started out doing it by focus actually borrowing their design from the city of New York. Uh, so they tweaked it and they customized it to what they needed. Um, but the, the key is, is that they save time and resources by reaching out to the folks around them and, and taking advantage of what's already been done. Uh, they also were very intentional about going after lots of grant funding in order to implement these projects. The majority of the capital costs are being funded through grants. Again, another affordability strategy. Um, they're very focused on partners and leveraging partner resources, particularly in their partnership with Yale University, which was lent a lot of technical resources as well as community engagement resources to the equation. And they've also been really intentional about making certain decisions, especially early on, about how they design and maintain these systems to create an onboarding opportunity for lower skilled workers and then meeting them with training in order to create a pathway for jobs. So it's a very elegant example of how um, what is otherwise some, you know, some roadside rain gardens, how it become a powerful force for the city of New Haven on, on a lot of different levels. And by keeping things really affordable um, and creating jobs at the same time. Next slide, please. Another, a third way, we've talked about policy setting, we've talked about intentionality in terms of implementation. Another way that communities are focusing on this idea of community wealth building is actually through collaboration and to fill knowledge gaps where gaps exist. Uh, a, a recent report that was put out called the Green Infrastructure and Health Guide, it has its beginnings in one of our work groups, uh, naming uh, appropriately called the Green Infrastructure and Public Health Work Group. Um, the, it, it then extended to become a larger partnership with the Willamette Partnership and the Oregon Public Health Institute. But this guide does three main things. The first thing it does is it makes practical recommendations for communities implementing green infrastructure for how those designs can be optimized to uh, really maximize public health outcomes. It makes practical suggestions for how the public health sector and the water sector can better communicate and coordinate. 
And ultimately, it opens the door to new sources of funding to help mitigate the costs of green infrastructure. So it provides a template of sorts for communities investing in green infrastructure to make that investment a real investment for its community members and a quality of life improvement for the community as a whole. Um, next slide, please. Um, another example, uh, not as pretty, uh, <laughs> of a way that uh, communities are collaborating to really advance the field and advance some of these concepts. Um, one of our work groups is called the Workforce Development Work Group, led by the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. With their leadership, they've done a scan of workforce development programs nationwide to find those ones that they felt were most um, sort of targeted towards disadvantaged communities, the ones that have the, the most sort of advanced uh, programs that are focused on green infrastructure, but also focus on community wealth building from the perspective of targeting disadvantaged communities. Um, and they're under, they're developing these recommendations that can be used by really any community interested in sort of sustaining a workforce for the long term for these green infrastructure programs. And so it's just another example of how communities are coming together, learning from each other about how to do this work better in order to advance the field. Um, and next slide. Uh, so lastly, um, just some, some takeaway ideas. Communities who are choosing green infrastructure are choosing an affordable and resilient water future for their citizens. But as we've talked about and as the report talks about, that requires intentionality. Um, and so ways that communities and particularly local governments are intentionally building community wealth um, are threefold. And there's, of course, a number of other ways, uh, but these are the ones that pop up in my mind. Policy and market signals, like we saw from the city of Grand Rapids. Direct programming and implementation and being thoughtful about how to scale up while remaining affordable, uh, like we saw through the city of New Haven. And lastly, collaborating with each other to fulfill knowledge gaps and to move the field forward uh, is a third main way we're seeing communities focus on these issues. And I think that's all for me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Paula, for bringing it home and uh, particularly for providing kind of the role that um, the local government can play in this as well. Um, and just generally a, a huge thank you to all of our panelists today uh, for providing their perspectives and what they're seeing on the ground. Um, it's been great to work with you all um, over what was the past year of writing this report. Um, I think that there are definitely bright spots that you all bring of how we can practice this um, and also uh, the questions that are still out there of how we continue to do this better. Um, and with that, I will transfer, uh, transfer us over to a Q&A. Um, I see that there, we have a few Q&As that are already there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can take a look at those and we can start to answer those questions. Great. Um, so the first one that I'm seeing is from Matt Hufton. Um, who said, uh, if this one's for Verde, um, and he is asking, um, does Verde provide all the training? Are participants getting college credit or industry recognized certificates? How does the training component accommodate adult learners or English language learners? Carlina, would you be willing to kind of uh, develop that out a little bit? Um, yes, that's, those are great questions. Um, so to start with the first question, does Verde provide all the training? Um, no, we offer kind of a hybrid model. So we do some of the in-house training via our crew leads um, and our crew supervisor and uh, landscape staff, but we also provide um, trainings that are given by people that we contract with, um, ideally here in the college community, um, but also just with other um, communities in Portland. And um, our participants getting college credit or industry recognized certificates. Um, yes, yeah, so we do offer, um, I mean, our crew members come from many different levels. So it can be even something as simple as um, helping them get a driver's license or um, some people would like to get their GED so that they, they can um, kind of be able to open up some opportunities um, later on in their careers with that. Um, we also do provide some industry specific certifications, primarily um, the, we offer 
support in obtaining um, herbicide licensing, which is really important with our contracts with habits for habitat restoration. Um, and I believe we also offer some other, um, for folks who are trying to start their own landscaping business, we also provide um, certi certifications that they'll need, um, such as the landscape contractor, um, the LCB license, the landscape contractor business license, and, um, and any other certifications that are needed for that. Um, and let's see, another, how does the training component accommodate adult learners or English language learners? So we, so yeah, all of our crew members are adults and um, they, most of them are actually e e English language learners. And the way that we work with them is really from the get-go when they enter a training program to provide kind of those, building those profession, general professional skills, including English classes and um, just really trying to kind of give them the space within the workplace to practice and learn English um, while feeling safe doing so, so that they can navigate the dominant culture, essentially. So um, yeah, <laughs> those are the, I think those, that answers everything. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kalina. Um, and I'm seeing another question here. Also, for those um, who do have questions, please feel free to jump it into the Q&A chat um, and we can see what we can do in answering them. Um, I'm getting another one here from Stephanie Geller. Um, are there best practices, and this is to anyone who wants to answer it, are there best practices strategies to get your local government to buy in? I often see nonprofits on the ground that get it, but in cities facing more short-term challenges like gun violence, et cetera, getting agencies to think about these issues is quite hard. Does anyone uh, of our pan panelists have a perspective on that? This is Matt from Pittsburgh. I quickly would love to jump in on that because my, my previous role before the Heinz Endowments was actually working here in city government. Um, and really the way that I saw this begin to shift um, kind of how people in government thought about it was that a real grassroots movement built up around it and really stressed that that intersectional point that I talked about that not only are these green infrastructure strategies good for the environment and good from a stormwater management perspective but that they also provide uh, all the co-benefits so new green spaces and neighborhoods that might not have them uh, living wage job opportunities for people who need them the ability to uh, train people in the use of new skills that are marketable in the in the kind of private world and a whole host of other benefits. So I, I think that I know it's it's not an easy process to kind of for nurture a, a grassroots movement around these things, but that's a, I think what it takes to try to convince local leaders that that it matters. Um, and if there are organizations on the ground in your city that are talking about this, I would say um, try to try to utilize that energy and, and just push local leaders to, to see all of the co-benefits of the strategy. Yeah, I think that's really powerful, um, kind of identifying these addition, like the, the multiplicative effect of green infrastructure. Did anyone else um, from our panelists want to uh, jump on to that question? Yeah, I could. This is Tandre with Dig Co-op. Great. Um, I'll just, just as ex our experience, uh, we're not a nonprofit, we're a co-op, although I've spent years before um, my work at DIG working with nonprofits and realized that the social strategies that they follow, gaining a base um, that has influence over local policies, uh, politicians to enact local strategies so for example in marin marin is pretty well known as a wealthy community with lots of resources and pretty advanced um, green infrastructure as far as policy and yet it's um there's a little bit of the redlining going on and that uh certain communities don't know if they aren't involved in city politics um and engaged, then they don't know they have funds available. They don't know that they have the, the power to appeal and use those funds in their area. And also I think greatest challenge is just the whole act and of, of organizing. Um, so nonprofits are well, generally well organized, the volunteer base is, uh, and also the 
paid staff are very um, focused. As far as us, as a co-op, I think, imagine the difference in my sense as a nonprofit is, is in a sense like a hunter hunting on to their issue. They're, they're gaming, they're getting their weaponry and they're going to battle on their issue. In our model, not that we can't follow that too, but we're more like fishermen. Um, so we're putting our bait on the internet and in the world and we're waiting for the people who value this to call us. Therefore, weeding out the trying to convince anybody element which is important, but a huge amount of resources and effort have to go into sitting at city councils or meeting with, and unpaid in a sense, unless you have a nonprofit grant. So as a co-op, we had to develop, develop a different strategy. We have worked with cities um, and in many cases, those were uh, earmarked for green jobs training, um, and special pilot projects. And those again, were based on uh, amazing individuals who spent their time working within the city governments to, to um, coordinate. So um, it really is, it's like a, in our experience for the longer term projects that have a greater impact you need to follow a nonprofit in a sense because our co-op doesn't have the capital to pay somebody at this point to spend hours at city council meetings or meeting with city council people and the mayor. So um, I hope that helps in some way understand like our, our limitations with what capital we have as a co-op. Yeah, and I think, um, thank you, Tandre. I think that really identifies this um, e ecosystem approach um, in terms of, you know, seeing the relationships between nonprofits and, um, and worker co-ops and how uh, we all relate to each other in a lot of ways on, on some of these advocacy issues. Um, pulling up another um, really salient question that um, definitely came up in the report as well um, is from Cameron Bailey, they ask, for northern climates like Minnesota's where we have six months of winter, snow frequently is on the ground and four, um, and four inch deep frost lines. How is full-time employment maintained for all employees year round? Um, any panelists wanna take that one on? Sure, it's Elisa from um, Pittsburgh. We can definitely take that one on. Great. Because um, we also, we're not, we're not oh, quite- Four foot, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're, we're not quite Minnesota, but we do get pretty cold and snowy here. Um, we, we actually avoid uh, full-time employment, and it's one of the reasons that we work hard to transition our crew members out into other employment. Um, our challenge comes because we don't necessarily um, transition out into other green jobs because of the seasonality and timing. Um, because landscaping in our part of the world is a seasonal job, we would rather people have more permanent um, positions that they can work on. So we use the experience, um, but not necessarily the, all, of, all of the hard skills that they've learned while they're with us. Uh, so that we know that our, we, have 12, we have six months um, with our crew members um, and our doors are always open for them to come back for additional support if they need additional support. But the idea is to get them, um, we kind of use the, the imagery of, of kicking them out of the nest after that six months. So we'd much rather in some ways have 12 months to spend the time with them to give them this, uh, more support that they might need. Um, but because of the weather here uh, and the contracts that we're able to get, at least at this point in our development, we need to make sure that they're, they're up and ready within six months. Great, thank you so much. And I think um, that's one piece that we uh, deal with a little bit in the report as well. So um, it, we've got a few strategies that we've identified. One being the, the model that Elisa uh, has talked about um, as well as some of the others that have been identified uh, across the country. So uh, please take a look at that. And um, 
just a, we have about 10 more minutes. So any burning questions, um, you know, if we don't answer your question in the next 10 minutes, please feel free to reach out to us or um, it sounds like many of these uh, panelists are open to you all getting in contact with them, feel free to, to reach out. Um, one of the other questions I'm seeing here is from Dave LeCru um, LeCur, thank you, excuse me, apologies for your last name. Um, they say, for the co-ops and social enterprises described, what percent of your funding comes from local government? What are the other main funding sources? Um, you know, I think there's a, probably a couple of different answers here in terms of contracting versus grants, but um, would anyone like to take that question? This is Carlina, and um, I can speak for, for the landscape. Um, the, our funding sources are primarily um, through our fee for service, and that's about, I think, 85% of our funding. And then uh, the rest, the 15%, we obtain um, through grant subsidy from government and foundations. Um, and we've recently, as a nonprofit, have started an, an individual donor program that um, could also bring in a little bit, a, a little bit of stream of money into our program. And with the subsidies, the grant subsidies, we work a lot with um, local soil and water conservation districts that um, give out grants um, at the intersection of green infrastructure and um, and social equity. Great, wonderful. Um, do other folks have any other uh, perspectives on, you know, the how you relate your grant funding to contracting uh, services? Well, Tondre here. Go for it. Just to speak on a co-op. Co so funding is, I guess, yeah, what we would say is 100% of our income is from, from uh, contracts. So uh, earlier in our work, we had more people involved as <clears throat> community liaisons to go out and find schools or public projects and appeal to local uh, politicians or, or organizations uh, to invest and find some way to make a project happen. And they would pull a grant on their behalf and maybe match funds. Uh, but we at this point funding is because we're a for-profit uh, C corporation we like to consider ourselves a mission driven for-profit not a profit driven for-profit so um, yeah funding is not uh, unless somebody unless we get to a phase of uh, operating capital where we can hire somebody part-time or as a sales um, someone who can um, investigate more projects. And I think at this point, we again, go back to the model of fishermen are waiting for our in interested clients to call us. And it's up to us to um, make a project happen within a budget in order to make income. So that's our, that's our strategy. Thank you. I think Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, Elisa from Landforce. We, um, we get about a third of our income from the contracts that we work on. We use that money to pay our crew members. Um, and then about a third from foundations and other donors and a third from um, federal and state, at least this year, federal and state sources. Um, but that's a new that's a new form of diversification for us. We haven't we haven't had the state or the federal for sources before. We don't actually get any funding directly from um, our local governments. Um, and that goes to the conversation before um, about using this, the ecosystem of partners to support us um, and proving the model as a way of um, engaging the city. And it also goes to one of the other questions about uh, union relationships. Um, so we have to be very careful about where we work and who we work with and the kind of work we work on because we want to make sure that we're working um, in cooperation with uh, city union employees and not conflicting with the kinds of work that they would otherwise do. 
Thank you. That was uh, exactly the next question I was going to throw out there. So thank you, Elisa, for um, kind of tackling this union question. That's one um, within the report. We also spent some time on um, thinking about the different relationships that um, social enterprise or worker co-ops can have with, um, with unions that have historically been in the water space. Um, and so that, I think it's a really salient and great point. Um, Great. If there are any last, are there any last questions that people are plugging into the chat here? Um, feel free. Um, I'm seeing one last one here uh, that, that I'm seeing around advocacy work for building codes, NPDES enforcing agency standards and city ordinances to require green infrastructure solutions. As, have any of you all been working on that type of advocacy? Hi, it's Elisa from Land Force again. I, at this point, we've just been we've been focusing on getting ourselves up and running. Um, and to Tandre's point, at the moment, we don't have the staff capacity to really engage in advocacy the way we want to. That will be a phase two for us. Great. Um, this is Matt. One, one of the one of the wonderful things that came out of the grassroots organizing I talked about around green infrastructure solutions is that our um, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority has adopted a green first approach. Um, they put out a plan back in 2015 that's a green first uh, plan for really prioritizing green infrastructure as the primary solution in a lot of these large scale projects. And that was really a direct result of some of that grassroots advocacy and some local leaders kind of taking up that charge. So that's been a positive step. That's actually a really good point. And um, I'll identified there is a similar kind of grassroots strategy that was utilized in um, Washington DC at the when there was a consent decree uh, where, where we currently have a consent decree I'm sitting in Washington DC right now and um, a group called Washington Interfaith Network and also the Center for Community Change um, identified that green infrastructure could be a more labor-intensive mechanism and also have all of these um, additional benefits associated and so they really advocated for the city to rearrange its consent decree to include much more green infrastructure and therefore create pathways for jobs for particularly um, the wards seven and eight which are some of our lower income um, wards that are actually right next to um, a large river. And uh, they actually were able to win that fight and it also kind of um, dovetails with the question of unions. Um, the, the city has now created a program in which they are um, getting people uh, a certification in green infrastructure, partic um, particularly from Ward 7 and 8 or folks that have had barriers to entry, and then are translating that um, by identifying DC Water, the union, um, uh, excuse me, DC Water, the, um, the, the, oh my goodness, my brain is, uh, the, the government agency that actually is implementing the work um, is working with the union to identify when their contracts start so that, um, it, and for, with their contractors, so that the folks who are going through the certification process actually have a very high rate of getting a job actually implementing this work after they've gone through the certification. Um, so that's another model and it, it was in coordination also with LIUNA, which is the union that's based here in DC doing that work. Um, and so we're at about 228. I know that there are still questions that haven't been fully answered, um, but I wanted to just take the few minutes here at the very end to say, to give a really deep thank you to everyone who um, hopped on the phone to be a panelist today um, and to share their stories of how, what this looks like when you're trying to do it on the ground on a daily basis um, and to share, share that knowledge with folks who are thinking about maybe doing something similar. Um, another huge thank you to the Summit Foundation who um, made the report possible and also is one of our co-hosts and also to the, um, the exchange um, for also their help <laughs> in putting this on as well. Um, and, you know, if you are looking 
for a, a, a physical copy of this report, please um, use the bit.ly link to get access. Um, and also feel free to look up the report itself online at community-wealth.org um, community slash green infrastructure. And um, my colleague Isaiah has dropped that into the chat to all of you, hopefully, and uh, want to say thank you uh, for, for tuning in today. Uh, feel free to get in contact with me as well if you're so interested. Um, my email has also been dropped into the chat and it is jbozua at democracycollaborative.org. Really excited to see how this uh, work can build out in the future. So thank you.